In this video, I will explain the output of the show IP root command. It contains information about connected routes, local routes, network routes, host routes, default routes, dynamic routes, static routes, and floating static routes. I will explain the meaning of each route in detail. I will use this network topology. I built it on Packet Tracer Network Simulator software. You can download it in this lab from our website. Links for both are available in the description given below. In this network, R2 has no configuration. Apart from R2, all other devices are configured. I will configure R2 in this video. When we start a router for the first time, it has no entries in the routing table. To verify it, we can use the, the show IP root command. As we can see here, at this time, this router has no entries in the routing table. There are three ways to update the routing table entries, automatic, manual, and dynamic. In the automatic method, the router automatically adds routing information to the routing table from the IP configuration we assign to its interfaces. The routes the router adds from the IP configuration of interfaces are called the directly connected and local routes. It uses the directly connected routes to reach the network connected to the interface. It uses the local routes to reach the interface. The router uses the network address of the configured IP address for the directly connected route entry. It uses the configured address as it is for the local address. This way, it adds two routes for each configured IP address. For example, here we have configured three IP addresses, so it should add six routes to the routing table. Let us view the routing table again. As we can see here, now the routing table has six routes. These are the directly connected routes. The router uses these routes to forward packets. For example, when it receives a data packet for this network, it forwards that packet from gigabit ethernet 0 slash 0. These are the local routes. The router uses the local routes to reach local interfaces for management purposes. When the router receives a data packet for any of these IP addresses, instead of forwarding the packet, it uses the packet to open a new connection for the sender device. For example, we can use any one of these IP addresses to connect the router through the SSH protocol. A network route represents an IP subnet. An IP subnet is a group of IP addresses. The subnet mask of the IP subnet tells the number of IP addresses it represents. For example, 192.168.0.4/30 is an IP subnet. The subnet mask of this IP subnet is 30. It represents four IP addresses. You can use subnet masks to identify network routes in the routing table. If a route in the routing table has a subnet mask in the range 8 to 30, it is a network route. In this routing table, these are the network routes. A host route represents a single IP address. A host route always uses the subnet mask 32. If a route in the routing table has the subnet mask 32, it is a host route. In this routing table, these are the host routes. The routes we add manually to the routing table are known as static routes. We add static routes in global configuration mode. We use the IP route command to add a static route to the routing table. This command needs three arguments, destination network, subnet mask, and exit interface or the next hop IP address. The router uses the letter S to indicate a static route in the routing table. To verify the added static route, we can view the routing table entries again. This is the static route we have just added. A router does not manage static routes. If we add static routes to the routing table, we have to manage them manually. For example, if a static route goes down, we have to manually remove it from the routing table. If we want the router to automatically add and manage routes, we have to configure a routing protocol on it. A routing protocol dynamically learns and adds routes to the routing table. If a route goes down, it automatically removes it from the routing table. Only the routers running the same routing protocol share routing information. If two routers running the different routing protocols, they will not share the routing information. In this network, the RIP routing protocol is running on these routers. Because of this, we also need to configure the RIP routing protocol on this router. RIP will dynamically learn all network routes and add them to the routing table. Routers use the letter R to identify the routes added by the RIP routing protocol in the routing table. Let us view the routing table entries again. These are the RIP routes. Routes added and managed by a routing protocol are known as dynamic routes. Routers use the routing table to make forwarding decisions. If multiple routes to the same destination exist, the router keeps only the best route in the routing table. To select the best route, it compares their AD value. Routers assign a unique AD value to each source that can add routes to the routing table. An AD value is the trustworthiness of root sources on a scale of 0 to 255. On this scale, 
0 is the most trusted, and 255 is the least trusted route. If two or more sources have routes for the same destination, the router selects the source that has the lower AD value. This router has two routes to reach the network 30.0.0.0/8. The static route that we manually added to the routing table and the dynamic route it learned from the RIP routing protocol. Since the AD value of the static route is less than the AD value of the route it learned from the RIP, it added the static route to the routing table. It will use this route to forward data packets it will receive for the network 30.0.0.0/8. To verify it, we can use the tracer command on this PC. This command prints the path the data packets originated from this PC will take to reach the destination. As we can see here, the router used the static route to forward data packets to the network 30.0.0.0/8. This default behavior creates a problem in a situation where we want to configure a static route as a backup route for the dynamic route. Because the static route has a lower AD value than the dynamic route and the router always takes the route having the lower AD value. To solve this problem, we have to change the default AD value of the static route. A static route with a custom AD value is called a floating static route. To use a static route as a backup route for the dynamic route, we have to configure its AD value higher than the AD value of the dynamic route. The AD value of RIP is 120. Hence, we have to configure the AD value of the static route higher than 120. Let us configure it to 125. Now the router will add this route to the routing table only when a route having an AD value lower than 125 is not available. Since the AD value of a RIP route is 120, the router will add a RIP route to the routing table if it is available. To verify it, let us view the routing table entries again. As we can see here, the router has replaced the static route with the dynamic route added by RIP. Now the router will use this route to forward data packets to the network 30. To verify it, we can use the tracer command again. Trace the path to the network 30 again. As we can see here, this time, the router used the path it learned from the RIP routing protocol. If this route goes down, the router will automatically add the static route to the routing table again. To verify it, we can shut down the interface the RIP route is using. RIP is using this interface to reach the network 30. If we shut down this interface, the router will remove the RIP route and add the static route again. Shut down the interface and view the routing table again. As we can see here, the router has added the static route again to the routing table. Now it will use this route until the RIP route does not come again. To verify it, let us trace the path to the network 30 again. As we can see here, this time the router used the static route to reach network 30. If the RIP route turns up again, the router will automatically replace the static route with the RIP route again. To verify it, let us start the RIP routes interface again. As soon as we start this interface, the router adds the RIP route to the routing table and removes the static route from the routing table. Let us view the routing table entries again. As we can see here, now the routing table has the RIP route again. We can also trace the path to verify the change. Let us trace the path again. As we can see here, this time it took the RIP route again. A default route is a route that a router takes when no other routes are available for a destination. Before we understand it, we need to understand how a router takes forwarding decisions. When a router receives a data packet, it matches the packet's destination address with the destination address of all routes available in the routing table. If it finds a match, it forwards the packet from the matching route. If it finds multiple matches, it forwards the packet from the route matching the maximum number of IP bits. If it does not find a match, it discards the packet. Let us understand this process through examples. The router receives a data packet for the destination 20.0.0.1/8. The router compares the destination address with all routes destination addresses. It finds two matches. As mentioned earlier, if a router finds two or more matches, it selects the route that has the maximum matching IP bits. In this case, the local route has the maximum matching IP bits. It matches all 32 bits. Therefore, the router selects this route to forward the packet. Routers select a route only when its network bits exactly match the packet's destination address's network bits. For example, the router will take route 20.0.0.0/8 when the packet's destination address's first 8 bits exactly match. The router will take the route 20.0.0.1/32 when the packet's destination address's all 32 bits exactly match. 
let us suppose the router receives another data packet for the destination 20.0.0.10/8. In this case, the router cannot take the local root 20.0.0.1/32. Only 24 bits of this root match the destination address. The router can take this root only when all 32 bits match. The second root requires the first 8 matching bits. The packet's destination address's first 8 bits exactly match with the first 8 bits of this root. Therefore, the router will take the second root 20.0.0.0/8. Let us take one more example. The router receives a data packet for the destination address 50.0.0.1/8. The router finds no root having the matching bits. In this case, the router will check the default root. If the routing table does not have a default root, the router discards the packet. If the routing table has a default root, it uses it to forward the packet. Let us configure a default root to understand this process in more detail. We configure default root similarly to the static routes. We use the same IP root command to configure a default root. The only difference is that in the default root, we use an IP address that has all zeros as the destination address of the root. After that, we specify the exit interface or the next hop router's IP address. Now, the router will forward all unmatched data packets to the next hop router. To verify it, we can trace the path to a network whose root is not available in the routing table of the router. As we can see here, the router did not discard the data packets of this network. Instead of discarding the data packets of this network, it forwarded them to the next hop router. Since the next hop router has no root for this destination, it's not forwarding them. Now, let us remove the default route to see how the router discards the unmatched packets. View the routing table entries again to verify the default route has been removed. Now, trace the path again. As we can see here, now the router is not forwarding unmatched data packets. We can also use the ping command to learn about the device till the packets reach. As we can see, the packets are not crossing the router 2. It verifies that router 2 is not forwarding unmatched data packets. Now, let us configure the default route again. Check the routing table entries again to verify the default route entry. Now send the ping requests again. As we can see here, this time, router 2 is not discarding the packets. It is forwarding them to the router 3. Since the router 3 has no route for this network, it is discarding the packets. Now, we know how many types of routes the routing table can have and how they work. Let us take a CCNA exam question based on the route types. In this network, what type of route will R1 use to reach host 10.10.12.10/32? Write your answer in the comment section given below. You have 10 seconds to solve this question. The correct answer to this question is the network route. The router will use this route for the given address. A network route is a route that belongs to a block of addresses. In slash notation, it has a value between 8 to 30 after the slash. All these are the network routes. Therefore, the correct answer of this question will be option B. Let us understand the remaining options. Routers use the default route when no other routes are available in the routing table. Since a route for the given address is available in the routing table, option A is incorrect. Routers use the letter S to represent a floating static route in the routing table. Since the routing table has no floating static routes, option D is wrong. A host route is a route that belongs to a specific host. In slash notation, a host route always has the value 32 after the slash. As we can see here, this routing table has no host routes. Hence, the option C is also incorrect. That's all for this video. If you have any suggestions, comments, or feedback about this video, please share them in the comment section given below.